to the YouTube. <clears throat> I don't know if you see any people on there. Two watching now. Uh, that might be us too, but hello if anyone's there right now. Oh, hey, there's people watching in the future too. So hello. We are just setting up everything um, as we do for the live thing so we're posting links on our website so people can find it and all that jazz And uh, yeah, hi, hi, hi. One more thing here, and then Oh yeah, I got some I got some hold music to play for you guys. We have royalty free. So it's not that good. But I won't get shut off of YouTube. Be back.
if anybody's on there right now, if you're watching, let us know if there's any sound problems or video problems. We're starting at five o'clock in about 10 minutes. With these live things, we always have to get them going sooner to do all the links and make sure everything's cool. So let us know if, um, if, uh, if anything's wrong. Besides me, I'm slow, that's not the computer. Let's see, the time is 4.52. Eight minutes. If you're looking in the little screen there on the side where I am, you can, you can now see. This is the newest addition to our tortoise family. We, um, you know, we have so many animals now, we've just stopped naming them, so. <laughs> so. His name is his name is Chiltepin. Because he really spiced up our lives. Because he really spiced up our lives. Katie's hiding. <laughs> this is Chiltepin. No, we got him, when was that? Is it uh, September? He's, uh, he's just one of the many, there's somebody who was breeding them and uh, and you know they they escape. They they lay eggs and they escape. And most of these tortoises you find in town, whether Tucson or Phoenix, they're um, they're uh, they're bred captive. Um, people are illegally breeding them, so you shouldn't do that. You should keep them separate. We have three desert tortoises, and uh, all three are separate because we don't really know the sexes of the two little guys. Willard is a male, right? That's why his name is Willard. <laughs> we'll go over how to tell later, but uh, not that I'm that good at it. But anyway, uh, meet Chiltapine, isn't he cute? All right, I'm gonna stop tormenting him and put him back. He's the only one that's awake. The other two desert tortoises are asleep right now. I'm gonna put him back. Um, we've got a few minutes before we actually start. Six minutes, so we'll be back.
tubes. Still got a couple minutes before we officially start, but I just want to get some feedback on sound and video and stuff. Sometimes we get a bad connection. Let us know if, uh, if, uh, come on here. Um, let us know if we have um, any connectivity issues or whatever. It's like nobody's saying anything so far, so I take that as that there's no problems. Either that or you can't hear what I'm saying. I'm... Is that what's happening? <laughs> of course, I don't know if you're in a position, you're in a place where you can actually uh, um, comment. Oh yeah, and also there's a, there's a delay. So mm -hmm. I always forget about the delay. <laughs> I always think no one's listening to me when I ask a question and then they answer late. So does that mean it starts late? Just by, it's like a minute or something. I don't even know if it's a minute. Um, but yeah, as soon as, yeah, <laughs> I just showed up there. Um, yeah, so as soon as you see, uh, see us, just let us know. Do we sound good? Do we look good? Do we look good? It's so weird not wearing a mask. Like, yeah. uh, and I'm so miss seeing people's faces. I wonder why, like, you know, I shaved recently and just made a little handlebar mustache. And then one day I was like, why did I even bother? Cause like, no one sees it. No one said anything. <laughs> I mean, you, you get to see it. I don't it. count. You, what? <laughs> you very much count. Let's not forget to switch that back and forth. Um, and yeah, so I think it's just about, oh, just turned five. So that, that means we can start. We are starting our class on, um, tortoise enclosures and, um, uh, and profiles of plants that are really good to put into a tortoise enclosure. So, um, so yeah, that's what this class is all about. We're not um, experts at, uh, we're not herpetologists, 
but we do have. We're not docking people. We're not. <laughs> we're not docking people. Um, but we do have five tortoises. Um, three are desert tortoises, and two are sulcatas. So we have the three desert tortoises are Willard, Chiltepin, who decided, and um, Footfoot, formerly known as Speedbump. Um, but uh, so the three of them, and there, there's Willard, who's about that big, and then Footfoot, who's really grown. We've had him for uh, a year or two years. A year and a half. About a year and a half, and he's grown. He's doubled his size already. And then little Chiltepin, who at the very beginning, if you were here, if you were on here earlier, you might have seen him. Um, Footfoot and Chiltepin are inside in terrariums. Um, Footfoot's sleeping. Um, Chiltepin is really young, so he's really not. He doesn't really go to sleep. And then uh, Willard's at the nursery, and he's also sleeping. And then we have the two sulcatas, and those are giant. They're big, big tortoises. And we'll talk about sulcatas and all that, but that's Flora and Flojo. Um, the picture actually in the, in the, you know, the people dressed up their tortoise there, that's actually a sulcata. So they're, they're cool. They're big tanks. Um, shouldn't get one unless you can uh, afford the space. Thank you for doing that for no flag staff. We can't talk to you right now. Um, so yeah, um, we have a lot of tortoises and we, um, this is uh, Ethel the glamour tort, oh, by you, the way. Oh, you know more about, about that than I just stole that picture off the internet. <laughs> on Instagram. Yeah. Um, they're on Instagram. What, what's his name? Her? Ethel the glamour tort. So her name is Ethel the glamour tort. And this couple always dresses up in the same outfit as their tortoise. I, I've seen some of the pictures. It's pretty great. But I didn't, I didn't know her name. <clears throat> so anyway, um, these classes are free. Um, we suggest if you can afford to, to um, you know, do the $15 donation if you can. If you can't, don't worry about it. We more want to disseminate information um, than make money off of this. Of course, when people do um, give us some money, it does um, encourage us to keep doing these kind of classes because our, our time is valuable. Um, this is this is the basic class agenda um before it, before we go through we're going to go through some resources basically where can you find out more information about keeping desert tortoises and even if you are interested in um in having a desert tortoise and you want to host one where do you find out information about that um and the general food plant guidelines um, for tortoises. And then we're just gonna launch into profiles of plants that are really good for tortoises. And we're gonna kind of do most of them organized by family because it's good to know things like that. Um, although that kind of falls apart at the end of the class where I, you know, there's major families that are really good for tortoise food. And then there's a few other weirdos that like they're here and there that don't necessarily <laughs> That it's not a whole family plants. So anyway, um, but first let's um, let's start off with the toast. We're going to we're going to check out this today. Can you see it? Uh, actually, let's go to full. Let's let's undo this for a second. Um, excuse all this for a moment. Um, I don't want to unshare screen. Oh, there it is. Okay, so there we go, full screen. Now let's see if we can focus in on that. We found this, um, how does it look on, oh, you can't tell yet. Oh, there we go. Uh, so we, we found this at Westbound. Um, Westbound's just down the street from us and and this one over here used to work there. So um, um, a, a tap and bottle, tap and bottle owned group, um, same company. But anyway, uh, this, um, this was really interesting. We just saw it and we were like, we don't know who these are, people are. Um, so it's called Town Under Black Distillery. It's a local Tucson distillery. And this is a blue corn whiskey finished with cacao husks. So we thought that we, that we thought that was kind of cool. Um, the labeling looks kind of cool. Um, anyway, that's, we, we merely went on this based on the packaging. But also because, like, look at it. This is and that it was local. It's look how, look how dark it is too. Um, I don't think it was finished in a barrel. 
um, they just they just soaked in cacao husks, I think. So that they, that they sourced from monsoon chocolate. From monsoon chocolate, which is another local business, and they got their blue corn from um, the Ute Indian tribe as well. So um, <clears throat> our friend Noel Patterson, who if you may have met on one of our, um, uh, was that a class or was that a? Uh, it was a social hour. It was one of our social hours where we met with um, Rob Easter and Noel Patterson um, talking about their blue corn whiskey. Um, and Noel uh, told me that they're really solid people and he was surprised that we didn't already know them, um, but we didn't, we don't know them. Um, and then um, the woman, there's, it's a, it seems like it's a woman and, and a man who do it, the company or own it or whatever. I don't like to make assumptions about who's doing what, but um, but she reached out on Instagram and said, "Hey, yeah, uh, that's us." And um, and she was the one that told me that they were getting their um, blue corn from the Ute tribe, and um, and yeah. So anyway, um, we have already sipped this, but we're going to pretend like we're doing it for the first time because <laughs> we, we can't not, right? So. Whoop. Get your drinks ready. We're going to do a little toast. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, all right. I'm just going to smell this. First. Oh, man, it does smell chocolatey, doesn't it? So if you're a fan of whiskey and of chocolate, definitely give this a try it's yeah. really quite tasty quite tasty so cheers do we want to cheers anything or toast to anything or just desert tortoises oh that's a good one let's toast to desert tortoises y'all oh man that's so good it is um funky too but very caramely yeah caramely definitely chocolate but it doesn't taste, it's not sweet. Um, oh, that's so good. Anyway. And it's not bitter. Um, <clears throat> no questions so far. Um, welcome, let's go back to the, let's go, let's start this class. Um, oops, <clears throat> I'm just doing the, all the things you have to do to do a class. Here we go. <clears throat> Our old friend, the slideshow. Okay, so um so let's uh let's start first of all with some places you can get information of course on our website we're always working on it we put um <clears throat> more information up there almost every week um but if you go click on um see right here uh those little those little dashes you, if you're on your i'm showing you on your phone it's a little more obvious on the computer, you just click the plant list and info button. Also, if you scroll down on the phone, there's a big button that says plant list and info. But you go to plant list and info right there, click that, oops. Um, and there's the plant, there's the top of that page. You scroll down to this plants for tortoise enclosures. And, uh, and it's very general. It just talks about the families and stuff, which we are gonna go through. I'm probably gonna um, expand upon it and put, um, put uh, more pictures and stuff. But um, also if you go to our online store and click um, under the categories, there's a whole category for uh, tortoise enclosure plants. So you can just look and see what we have available now. That won't have everything that's good for tortoises. It'll just have whatever we're selling now it, that's good for tortoises, but there you go. Um, of course, the Tucson Herpetolog Herpetological Society, um, you uh, might have been with us when we talked to Robert Anthony Villa, who's the president. Um, lots of information through the Herp Society and we highly recommend joining them. Um, their meetings are cool. They, um, it's, it's Nerdville, man. If you like Herps and you're a nerd, you should uh, totally join the Herp Society. <clears throat> and then Arizona Maim and Squish has a page um, and on desert tortoise care. Um, th both of these are also linked on our tortoise page. So if you go there, you will find pretty much all the information you need. 
Um, and, you know, th this page has, you know, uh, information about taking care of them, making sure they don't get sick. What are the things that cause them to get sick, um, etc. Okay, so those are some online resources. Also, uh, if you look, if you're looking at me right now, this book, if you can find a copy, I think it might be out of print, but you find it in in used bookshops, you could probably find it on um, online. Um, don't use Amazon, use somebody else. Um, but uh, uh, this is the Sonoran Desert Tortoise, Natural History, Biology and Conservation by Tom Van Devender, our own Tom Van Devender. He is uh, also a botanist and uh, a very important natural history historian in our region, and we love Tom. So uh, there's some resources for you if you want to find out more. Uh, this is who we're talking about mostly today, the Sonoran Desert Tortoise, um, Gophurus Morofkai, Morofkai, Malachi. Um, it sounds like a uh, children of the corn, but anyway, um, that's the, this is the tortoise we're talking about today mostly, um, which is a little bit separate from, so this guy used to be lumped together with the Mojave Desert Tortoise. Um, so the, the red and the blue is the distribution of both of those tortoises. They both used to be considered um, Gophurus um, agassizii, but um, not that long ago, the Sonoran Desert Tortoise was was distinguished as its own species. So in the blue there is the is the natural distribution of the tortoise we're talking about today. Um, so you can see it goes down all the way to Sinaloa there. Um, and um, they tend to like um, desert Sonoran desert scrub. So like they you know, they like those uh, the, you know Sonoran desert is a is a bi-seasonal desert, right? So in the Mojave Desert, which is to the west of us, is um, a winter rain dominated desert. It's dry and dead in the summer and hot. Um, and all their precipitation occurs in the winter time. To the east of us is the Chihuahuan Desert, which is where they get all the rain in the um, summertime and they get no winter rain. So we're right in the right in the middle so we get winter rains and summer rains, <laughs> or do we? <laughs> do we? <sighs> anyway, um, so uh, Sonoran Desert Scrub is what this tortoise likes. Um, so um, they're they're very well known around the Santa Cruz Valley, which is where we're at, um, and uh, in in the. Um, the grass, they get as far, far up as grasslands like they like when you find them in, um, you know, the, uh, uh, oh goodness gracious, Tumacockery, Tubac area, like um, even Nogales, that's grassland. Um, and they're there, um, they're in the San Pedro River Valley, which is grassland. So um, they're cool little guys, of course, and you already know that. Uh, one quick little thing, don't freak out about it. I never have, but uh, um, tortoises can give you salmonella because it's in their gut. That's what one of the things they use to digest food, I guess. I don't know, but it's in their gut. So you should wash your hands. Um, just don't like handle your tortoise and then grab your sandwich. Although I've probably done that because I'm, <laughs> I'm not a germaphobe. Um, but, uh, you know, um, but anyway, so, uh, you should wash your hands and be safe. Don't get salmonella. It, it probably sucks. Um, um, <laughs> uh, so, um, th th when you, when you have an enclosure, one of the main, the, the most important thing, if you're going to have a tortoise at your house and you, you, you really want one you have to make it inescapable, meaning that like you can't just put a little chicken wire fence around, it's gonna get out. They can dig, they can dig under things, you know? So if you, if you have a little um, cinder block wall or whatever you're using to, uh, to keep them in, make sure it goes down in the ground a little bit, you know? You don't have to go that far, they're, they're, they don't work that hard. I would worry a lot more about sulcatas so, so because they can dig the china. But um, 
but uh, the um, these guys can um, they can they're escape artists, and that's why there's so many um, needs for um, rescues because they're always getting out. Willard, um, our big tortoise, was an escapee. He was in the city, roaming around in a in, on Willard Street, which is where he got his name in Tucson. So, um, so you know they. Um, just make sure your tortoise enclosure is secure and not only for them to stay in it but i like what this guy in the bottom left did he obviously has little guys um because big one that's not enough space for but but he probably has some little guys that he raises in there and then the top screen there keeps birds out that's one of the reasons that we have our little guys inside is you know when they're this big they can get predated by birds and, and stuff. So, um, so we keep them inside, although I'm thinking about building something like that guy's built for his little guys. Um, and then that on the top left, there's, it almost looks like, I don't know if that's the Sonoran Desert Museum or not. I, I grabbed, I stole that from the internet, but, um, <clears throat> but uh, the, the, the Desert Museum has lots of enclosures like that though. And, um, so just the the main import the main important thing is that in their enclosure they can't get out. Um, they can climb, by the way. So uh, it's better to have a solid wall. And to be honest, at our nursery we just have a little chicken wire fence. Well, it's better than chicken wire, but it's still like he climbs it and he gets out. And luckily he can't get out of the nursery because the nursery is totally fenced around. But um, we're about to to make a more permanent. A wall in there so he can't get out and so he can't climb the the wire yeah um so uh and then the enclosure it should be um in a place where water doesn't collect so it's better in a high point um and um you know it it, it really is better to have them above ground like this um, you know, so like, you know, most people here have used some kind of um, cinder block with the you know, wood or something. Um, I would use something a little more sturdy than that one on the right because that looks like particle board and that will, will warp after some time. Um, so something even a little thicker than that would be probably better than what that person has done. But, um, but you know, something where when they, when they decide to go to sleep, they're protected, um, but they're not going to drown when it floods. Um, and, uh, and they can, you know, be a little bit protected from the, the elements. Obviously, these are wild, wild critters, so they, uh, they can handle our temperatures, but uh, they usually dig down into a nice little space and, and little nook, so they're safe. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that little operatic aria there, but... Uh, I believe that's sirloin, one of our cats. Anyway, um, so uh, you know, there's some ideas for for their little um, Burrow. burrows, yeah. Um, and by the way, they usually dig down a little bit when you when you make a, something like this. They'll go in and, and they'll dig down. So it's good to put it up a little bit so that um, and 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 also to not have you know rain. Like make sure there's no roof near this area where the water is going to pour on that thing um, during a rainstorm. It's okay if some rain falls on it, but um, you don't want it in a place where water's collecting because they're going to be, in the wintertime especially, they're sleeping there, and you don't want that water to flood in there when they're, when they're slow or sleeping. Um, don't mix your, your dog with your tortoise, okay? Um, so... Um, I love this. It looks like a, 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 a one of the old eighties um, drug. drug, yeah, drug yeah. ads. Like, um, but anyway, <laughs> don't don't mix with tortoises. Um, dogs are terrible for tortoises, and one of the number one ways that they die. Um, and dogs just can't help themselves, especially bigger dogs. So we have Chihuahuas. And they're nowhere near the tortoises, but um, their their mouths are a little too small for the bigger ones, so they're no issue for the bigger tortoises. But the little ones they could probably kill. So we you gotta you gotta keep them separate. Um, I think some of the uh, some of the rescues, like the Desert Museum does a rescue, and I think the Arizona Fish and Game does one. Um, 
but the rescues that are out there, I think a lot of them, if you have a dog, they just say no. Um, Desert Museum does. Yeah. So uh, just know that. <clears throat> um, okay. There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, we talked about this already a little bit, but the, when they're little like this, they're little, you can see that guy's as big as a quarter. Um, if you were, uh, online before, um, um, if you were online before five o'clock and we were setting things up, I showed you our little guy. Um, he's about that big. They're like not much bigger than a quarter. So, uh, we keep them inside in a terrarium and, uh, and, um, you know, we have a we, we have both a heat lamp and a light lamp for their shell. So um, if you go to any um, reptile place, they will set you up with the right um, lighting for um, for tortoises. They might also sell you a sulcata and not tell you that it gets this big. They'll think, oh, isn't this cute? You should buy this. And they won't tell you that it gets big. Um, pet stores suck. But um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, and also, so uh, if you do have them in a tank like this, make sure they have water. Um, they don't always drink it with their mouth. They, uh, they, they drink through their anus too. So, <laughs> so they'll get in it like that, that tortoise in the bottom left there and, um, and drink through their anus. I'm not making that up. They really do that. Um, I think I have that right, right, Robert? Um, he's the one that told me that, or maybe Robert was just messing with me. No, I think they really do. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we, you know, we, obviously we feed our plants, um, uh, native plants too. So this is the, uh, Sulcata tortoise. <clears throat> and this is the other tortoises that we have too. And there's other tortoises that people keep by the way. And that we're not particular. There's the Russian, there's that Russian tortoise. That, there's a leopard tortoise. Leopard tortoise. So, and I don't know much about a lot. Of, I think the Russian can be kept outside. I don't know about the leopard tortoise. I think but, so. But, um, you know, follow the parameters for all those types of species. I'm, we're only sharing what we know. I want to just make a special note about this guy, though, because I just made that joke about pet stores being crappy, but it's true. They sell them like this all the time, those little cute babies. And everyone wants a tortoise that looks like that. It's really cute. And they don't tell them that they get so big. Um, and so there's there's several rescues um, in town trying to trying to manage this problem. Because if you're, a, you know, if you're just a regular old Joe and you just, you know, you don't have, you don't necessarily have room for a sulcata in your yard or the right yard. I mean, you have to have the right situation and not everyone does. And so as you suddenly end up with a tortoise that big, what are you going to do? And a lot of the times they're trying to, they're not trying to ditch their tortoise. The tortoise just gets out and you think tortoises are slow, man. They cruise. And so they get out and they're gone. And then of course someone picks it up because they're like, what is this cool animal? And but anyway, uh, there's a huge, there's rescues all over the country in, in, in the South, um, in Southern you know, latitudes where, uh, where it's warmer for them, you know, and they, they're outside. Um, obviously they don't have this problem in New York because it's too cold for them. But, but in the Southern latitudes, there's a, this problem with tortoises um, getting out. And um, so, uh, just be responsible and just know, ask questions when, when people, and do research, I mean, ask questions, but also not trust what the pet stores are going to tell you or not tell you, uh, just figure out, you know, what you're getting into with these guys. Um, both, all of our tortoises are rescues, by the way, the two sulcatas are both rescues, um, and all the desert tortoises are rescues, and they were probably all, Willard, Willard is probably was probably wild because he's very healthy. It looks like he's always eaten native foods, although he's very social. But the other guys that we have, the desert tortoises and the sulcatas are definitely like bred in captivity and escapees. Well, and the other thing is that they can live for a long time. So you, you have to like, it, you're in it for the long run. You got to put them in your will. Yeah, they live, it's like a parrot. It's going to live longer than you. So yeah, good point. As long as it's healthy. <clears throat> yeah, as long as you take good care of it. And we're gonna help you do that, right? So um, see this here? Uh, this is the kind of thing that people love to feed tortoises because you know, they really do kind of go for it. It's like junk food, but guess what? 
don't do it, okay? Just don't do it. Um, human food, so this is, you know, I don't know if this is gonna be news to you or not, but agri food raised in agriculture sucks, okay? It sucks, it's low in nutrients, it's terrible for you, and it's terrible for tortoises. So um, why is that? I can teach a whole class on that, but like basically in, in industrial agriculture, um, the plants have way less nutrients. And um, so they're just not very good for tortoises. Plus uh, too much fruit is also not good for tortoises. They really should be mostly eating greens, mostly eating leaves, and maybe flowers of plants and the occasional little snack of a fruit, try not to feed them this stuff. And I know some people who have tortoises started off this way because they didn't know better or the people who had the tortoise before them didn't know better. Um, it's not good for them. So, um, so stop feeding them this stuff and, and don't worry if you change their diet and they look like they're not gonna be interested in the stuff that you're trying to feed them. Um, don't worry, they eventually come around, you know, it's just that like you're, you've spoiled them. And then of course they, they, they see that red fruit and they're going to go for it. And then they expect that all the time. And, you know, just like if you, if somebody fed me Whataburger every day, if I was in a cage and they just fed me a big hand came down and gave me a Whataburger, I'd be really into that <laughs> confession, but, uh, it'd be terrible if that's all I ever ate. Right. So, um, so anyway, um, I know, I know you think this is, these are healthy foods, right? Even for people, they're not, okay? Um, buy, buy food, buy small farmers if you can, but well, this isn't a human care class, so let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's start into the plants that, you, that are good for um, desert tortoises. And by the way, um, these are also good for the cicadas. So they could, and, and, and any other tortoise, like tortoises uh, are, are pretty, at least all the ones that I know about um, can eat a lot of the same things. Um, oh yeah, one just general thing, um, don't be afraid to put a plant that's, that's poisonous to a tortoise in a tortoise enclosure. I know that sounds like bad advice, but Tortoises are smarter than you are. They don't eat stuff they don't want. And they certainly don't eat stuff that's poisonous to them. They will eat stuff that's not healthy for them, like the strawberries and the lettuce and stuff, but the iceberg lettuce. <laughs> but, um, but, but they don't eat stuff that's poisonous to them. So um, you don't have to like lose sleep, like, oh man, is that thing? And, and we're gonna talk about another plant later on in this, this thing that, that uh, taught me a lesson let's just say that um, but native grasses are one of the most important foods obviously of a desert tortoise that's one of their main foods um, and you know pretty much any grass will do uh, all you know grasses are chemically very similar um, and and uh so they, they can't eat any of them, but some of them are better than others for, for a few reasons. One, just access. Like, does the grass grow low enough for them? Um, and um, also, does the grass grow fast enough for the tortoise? One of the things you're going to find out when you have tortoises and you're, you're keeping them in an enclosure is, man, they can mow through stuff. So you need plants that can um, keep up with their appetite, especially as they get bigger. The bigger they get, the, just, the quicker they mow through everything. So you, you need plants that can keep up with that. Um, as far as grasses are concerned, our, our two of our favorites to sell for tortoises are also the ugliest in containers. <laughs> this is our number one selling grass and it always looks horrible in the container. It looks like we're trying to sell people Bermuda grass. Uh, I promise you we're not. Uh, this doesn't look anything like Bermuda grass. It's a much thicker leaf. Um, did it? No, it just keeps it up there. Huh? Okay. Um, sorry, technical thing I'm looking at. Um, so this is uh, Hopia obtusa vine mesquite. It's called. It's not a mesquite, obviously. I don't know why they call it mesquite. Um, there's a couple grasses they call mesquite. But anyway, uh, it does often grow under mesquites, actually. Um, and uh, it likes, in nature, you see it in slightly shadier spots 
and also a little bit more moist. You, you find it under uh, moist spots in low areas and, and under mesquites and stuff like that. Um, it's broadleaf. It's got a bigger seed than most uh, native grasses have. And um, so it's, it's also good for uh, those granivorous birds like um, goldfinches and stuff like that. Um, but um, I'm going to tell you that it always looks terrible in a container, especially now because uh, actually most of our grasses, uh, I should go back one step here. Most of our grasses are warm season growing grasses. Our native grasses are mostly warm season. There's a few that are evergreen. Um, but even in a one gallon container, those evergreen grasses can be kind of brown in the winter time. And the, the winter dormant ones are brown, brown, brown. So this plant right now, like we have some for sale at the nursery and it looks dead. And so it's funny because we still sell them. And, and uh, sometimes we joke like, yeah, we're selling dead plants, but we're not selling dead plants. They're really, it's alive and they green up very soon actually. Um, so yeah, it's a winter dormant grass. Um, now, you do want to think a little bit about dormancy when you think about your tortoise. Most tortoises are, are asleep the whole winter time, right? So some of the plants we're talk about, most of the plants we're going to talk about are going to be warm season growing plants, but we are going to show you a few cool season growing plants because um, if you have a baby like ours that isn't sleeping, you need something to feed them and dormant grasses are not going to cut it. We'll show you what to do. Um, but most of them are going to be warm season growing. Okay, so um, the, and, and as far as grasses, the only cool season grasses that, um, that are really around are some of the fescues. Um, and a lot of those aren't even native, but they're fine. Um, you can use them. Also the, the rye grasses are good. Um, yeah, so another grass that we like that spreads and keeps up with the appetite of the tortoise. And I also like the bloom on this guy. Um, I, we don't have, you know, grasses are hard to photograph, so we don't have the greatest pictures of um, native grasses. Um, some grasses are harder to photograph than others. This is one that it's really hard to get a good photograph of, but it's a really great grass. It's, it's an attractive one, but it does spread uh, quite a bit. And so this is another good tortoise plant and it will keep up with the, the, the appetite. If you have a particularly alkaline soil, by the way, this plant will tolerate it pretty well. So that's called Tabosa. By the way, uh, Pleurathus mudica uh, used to be known as Hilaria muticus. So if you're familiar with that and you don't know what this is, and that's what that, it, it's the same plant. Oh, by the way, too, Hopia obtusa used to be Panicum obtusum. So uh, sorry, botanical names. Um, it doesn't matter to most people, but just in case some of you are there watching and you're like, well, I thought that was uh, Panicum. Well, it is. Um, just the, it's just an old name. <clears throat> Here's a plant that taught us a lesson. Um, with our first tortoise, when, when he'd be walking around, uh, they'd start eating the spurge. And, and spurge is poisonous to like everything. It's, it's got that milky latex and you know, it's, 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 uh, it, that latex is a defense mechanism. Um, so like, um, it's kind of amazing. Uh, this, this tortoise, my, you know, my baby tortoise was going after it and I pull it away and don't eat that. And then, uh, and I think it was in this book I read and I was like, oh, it's actually one of the most important foods for them. So it's not only is it edible, it's actually really important to their diet. They, they really depend on this plant probably because it's so prevalent. Um, this is a summer annual. There are several species of, of formerly known as Chemosyce, by the way, um, but it's now Euphorbia. Um, there's Alba Marginata. There's, uh, there's a ton of them, and I can't even remember all the names. Um, my mentor, Richard Felger, wrote uh, the treatment with this guy, Victor, on this plant, and he used to always joke that to distinguish a lot of the species, he got a you, you you gotta look at their nuts. Uh, uh. You can always make that same joke. <laughs> Men and their jokes. Um, so uh, yeah, you gotta look at their nuts to tell them apart. Um, but there it is, Euphorbia species, formerly Chemosyce. Uh, you know this plant even if you don't know it, right? You've seen this thing, it's a weed. It grows 
everywhere. You don't have to plant it, right? It's going to show up in your yard. If there's some moisture in your yard, it'll show up, uh, especially if you buy plants from nurseries because we all have this weed. And it's funny because it's really changed my mind about you this this these spurges because I, I used to see them as very annoying and now I see them as like oh it's food and so um you know I when I when at the nursery um we we either have Willard marching around um weed patrolling or we just pull them out of the containers and feed it to them and they love this stuff so much so um very good food for them it's free you're gonna get it for free you can go to your neighbor's house and get it for free. Um, there's another plant there too, another euphorbia. That's euphorbia heterophylla. It is a primitive poinsettia. There are several species of these wild poinsettias that uh, were used to create the modern gaudy Christmas poinsettia. Um, that's a euphorbia. Weird, right? Euphorbia is a very big group. Um, tortoises can eat almost any euphorbia, at least if it's herbaceous. So. Um, I don't know if they can eat the succulent ones, but I don't know that I would sacrifice the succulent. Can they eat the poinsettia? Yeah, they can eat the poinsettia. But don't feed poinsettias to tortoises, not because of the being a euphorbia, but because most poinsettias are grown very toxically <laughs> in greenhouses. Uh, and we're not producing poinsettias yet, so there's no organic poinsettias yet. So avoid them if you're... Uh, <laughs> Avoid them as a tortoise food. And also you shouldn't bring something like that into your house anyway, but whatever. It's not a people class. Um, this family, the Malvesi, the Mallow family. And you know that plant uh, in the corner there, although that's a rather bright orange variety of it, but um, that's Spiralsia ambigua. I knew you knew that. Um, globe Mallow. This is uh, one of the most common plants in our region. And if you were here two years ago when we had our super bloom, um, there were fields of this, they were so vast, just vast, vast fields of, of globe mallow. Um, it's a very interesting plant and I could talk about it forever and really bore you with some things about it. But, um, but this is a good tortoise food. They eat the flowers, they eat the leaves. Um, they're kind of weedy and reseed. That's another quality that I always look for in a good tortoise plant is that, you know, will they volunteer and make more? So, um, so yeah, uh, it's a great plant and it's native too. When I use the word weedy, um, this came up in, a, in a, another class we did recently. Um, I'll tell you if I'm talking about bad weedy. Usually when I say it's a little weedy, it means that it, that it reseeds very well. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the Malvasi, but here's three more. And that one on the upper left is one that you probably know, but you didn't know the name of. That's cheeseweed. Um, there's other names for it too. Um, some people just call it mallow. <clears throat> um, Malva neglecta. Um, there's another similar species too that I can't quite remember the name of. But this is that uh, cool season mallow. So, so if you have... Uh, a baby desert tortoise, let this weed come up in your yard. And this is exactly what our babies are eating right now. So um, actually in our sulcatas who don't, haven't really gone to sleep this winter because it really hasn't gotten cold. Um, I've been tossing these into their pen as well. Um, you, when you pull it up, it, it's, uh, you can feel it. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the characteristics of plants in this family is they're all kind of mucilaginous. And, uh, and I'll talk about another plant in this family that you already know, and you probably know that it's mucilaginous. But, but yeah, when you pull that weed up, you know, and this is weed, this is, this is a weed that's not native by the way, but it's just here. Um, and it doesn't tend to really, I haven't seen it be a problem in the wild. I see the problem in areas that have been disturbed, mostly in backyards, um, you know, in unneglected backyards, you see it uh, coming up. I think it's tall, you know, as tall as, as you are sometimes. Um, so, um, so anyway, uh, that's a great plant. It's free and it's, an, it's a winter grower and it grows up until summer. So um, when the tortoises are first waking up, they'll take advantage of this as well. The one 
there's there's several species of hibiscus that are native to the southwest culturized probably the, the most common one um and uh and is a good uh food plant for them and and, and don't uh anthropomorphize plants by the way and think if there's something i don't like about it the tortoise won't like it either so like hibiscus culturae has the kind of stinging hairs on it right and it, it kind of makes your hands itchy when you when you deal with it the tortoises don't care about that um they'll eat it and they really love the flowers a lot of plants um it, that they really want the flowers more than the leaves um, as is the case of that superstition mallow on the right um they will sometimes eat the leaves here's another thing too i i, I forgot to mention um tortoises are all different just like people are and they're different throughout their life so um some people will tell me my tortoise has never eaten mallow before and and um and then there's other people who are like my tortoise will only eat mallow um and uh then but also as you raise the tortoise throughout its life you will notice that they start to prefer different things at different times in their life and i don't know what the reason is for that um but it probably has something to do with their natural history um but the point is is like don't give up on something if they don't eat it right away because um, they probably will eat it. And also they're eating when you're not watching, even though you think you're watching it every moment of the day. And sometimes you kind of are close to doing that. Um, you're really not. And they're eating when you're not looking and they eat things that you don't notice. So just be aware of that. Um, here are some domestic um, plants that are in the same family, the Malvaceae. Um, so it's a plant that you might already have growing for whatever reason. Uh, everyone has a hibiscus in Tucson. It's like, it's like, we, we almost might sell this plant. I've, we've contemplated it before because we're like, well, it's not going to be weed. It's not native, but it is, it is a new world. It's Mexico. Um, Southern, I think. I, I don't know. Actually, Rosa Sinensis, I have to look that up. But anyway, it's not a weed problem, but man, it's like a heritage plant. Like, uh, you know, Mexican families have been bringing hibiscus to Tucson long before uh, any of us got here, um, except for indigenous people. But it's, it's, a, it's almost a, it's almost a, um, it's almost like, uh, what's the word I already used? Uh, like a staple? Heritage, it's heritage. a heritage. <laughs> uh, I need a drink, hold on. It's almost a heritage plant. Anyway, tortoises love it. And of course the red ones, they love colors. Um, that plant up in the upper left-hand corner, we sell every summer. It is um, <clears throat> an annual, but it grows really big. It's Hamica. You might know it as Roselle. Um, and uh, it's the same thing that makes Hamica. If you're um, at Food City, you can buy um, Hamica dried and make tea out of it. And it's this, <clears throat> it's like a real astringent, um, wonderful tea. And uh, anyway, the tortoises love the leaves. They love the flowers. They just love this plant. Um, it grows really fast and really big and you end up with a billion seeds at the end of the season. So you can replant it. So um, of course people often don't, bother regrowing things from seeds and you know we're not i'm not doing us good by telling you like hey you can grow free plants you just save the seed um people will still come back anyways because i don't know i guess i know i know about this we get lazy sometimes and we don't want to regrow things that's cool um great tortoise plant and okra that uh, upper right hand corner there that's okra and it's a mallow so you're getting a little botany here right you, you see that um all these plants, these are all mallows, malvasi. You can kind of see a similarity, right? They all have the kind of similar kind of flower. Anyway, they can eat the whole okra plant. So uh, a lot of people grow okra and they never eat it. Mucilaginous. <laughs> Mucilaginous. Remember I said that trait? Mucilaginous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Katie's always, around. Katie's bringing me back around. 
I was talking about mucilaginous trait of the Malvasi. Okra, mucilaginous, unless you cook it a certain way. Um, so uh, all the plants in that family have that trait. If you, if you mush up the leaves and you'll feel it, you'll feel this mucilaginous thing. Well, anyway, tortoises love that. Some people don't. <clears throat> all right, new family, the Onagraceae, the prim evening primrose family. And mostly we're gonna talk about Onothera. Um, and uh, so Onothera uh, speciosa is in the picture there. Here's a good plant that can keep up with the appetite of the tortoise. It spreads like a mint. It spreads fast. One plant, you pop it in the ground, it'll be six feet in diameter. Um, it really sp spreads. So, you know, there's certain places you don't want to plant like that, um, but in a tortoise enclosure, you do. And it's pretty. It's a, uh, most of the, these plants are pollinated by um, the uh, moths. Um, uh, what's that? Um, Oh, what's it called? That hummingbird uh, moth. The white line sphinx moth is uh, the main pollinator for a lot of our native onotheras. They uh, mostly open up at night um, and uh, or, or, or they open up actually kind of at dusk um, and then bloom all night long up until about noon and then at noon they start to close up. Um, not all onagracy do that, but a lot of them do. Um, Onagracy and Nictaginaceae, and we'll talk about those. But uh, here, there's some good plants that keep up with their appetite. Um, Epilobium canum, the hummingbird trumpet, um, or the California fuchsia, that's the name we usually use. And like, we like that name better, right? Desert fuchsia. Desert fuchsia. That's even better because it's not just in California. Um, we've seen that plant, Epilobium canum, we've seen it blooming in. In this year, in the driest year when nothing else is booming, we, where were we when we were, we were in the, where, was it the Gila River? No, it was Sycamore Canyon. No, 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 when we were in, um, when we were in uh, Sa near Safford and we went to that, oh, what's that area called? The Gila Box. The Gila Box. Um, it was so dry. Everything was just dead. And I, I remember I saw the hummingbird and I was like, what is he eating? And um, we found this was the only plant that was, and it was blooming on the driest year when nothing, when the cacti are complaining, their epilobium is often blooming. It's kind of an amazing plant. Um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> that, that's a good plant for hummingbirds. Um, tortoises love it too. And it does spread. It's, a, it's native to washes and it suckers under the ground. And actually it's one of those plants that just sort of moves it it doesn't stay in one place. And that might be annoying for people who like their everything and perfectly placed, you know, whatever. Uh, don't get that plan if you're that person because <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be like nah, 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 and it's gonna <laughs> go all over your garden. <laughs> and that's actually a trait of a lot of plants in this family. Um, not that little tidy guy on the right there though. Um, Unathir cespitosa is, uh, is tidy. It doesn't, um, it does recede. You, it will volunteer quite a bit, but it, um, it's a cespitose. It stays in one little area and, 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 and just takes up about a foot or a foot and a half at the most. So there you go. There's Simona Gracie. Um, the legume family is another one that is almost counterintuitive because a lot of legumes are sort of poisonous but not for tortoises. Um, and then on the, on the right there, that picture is a royal lupin. We sell this plant. Um, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a winter annual. Most legumes, well, a lot of legumes are perennials, um, but there are also quite a few annuals and there's a lot of lupins. There's many, many, many lupins that you can grow. And, uh, and so this is another one that if you need some winter food, uh, that you can have and you can have this growing for your your little babies. <clears throat> um, by the way, they also are very good for the soil because legumes fix nitrogen. Um, this plant is one I highly recommend uh, for a tortoise enclosure because why? It keeps up with the appetite of the tortoise. Um, it it grows very very big very fast. It's it's a low growing plant 
So that's good, right? Because tortoises aren't the best climbers in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we don't have any arboreal desert tortoises in, in the Sonoran Desert. <laughs> they do climb though. They do climb fences. Um, yeah, yeah, good point. But they don't climb trees. Uh, anyway, this is a great plant for them uh, because it keeps up with their appetite and they actually eat it. Um, and there's several dahlias actually that, that, that can grow that way. There's dahlia capitata there in the bottom left. That's another low growing one. And it does grow almost as wide and vigorously as the as dahlia gregii. Um, on the upper left-hand corner there is prairie acacia. Used to be acacia angustissima, now it's acaciella angustissima because there's no more New World acacias. We won't go into that, but anyway, it's a low-growing acacia, um, and it's a grassland species, so um, it's totally native in the areas that tortoises are very common in. So um, cool plant too. It's just a cool plant. Um, it suckers like uh, under the ground. It, it's not. It's a shrub kind of, um, but it, it it suckers like a perennial, and um, and, uh, and there's always low foliage for it. So the tortoises really do like eating this. And it's also one of the best butterfly plants you could possibly plant. There's a million butterflies that use it as a larval food plant and the flowers are, are irresistible to butterflies. So uh, prairie acacia, man, you gotta plant that. We've got, of course gotta grow more because every time we grow any or have any, they um, sell out. So anyway, and then the fairy duster. Uh, that's a great plant for tortoises. They love it. Um, it's, uh, you know, not always as foliated um, if it's not well watered. So if you water it a little better than allowing it to live off rainfall, um, then of course it's better. Here's a surprising one, right? <clears throat> this family, Zygophilaceae, um, the Caltrop family. Um, and of course, we all know this plant because you are a great citizen of the Sonoran Desert and you know that this is the most important plant <laughs> in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, I don't know, maybe ironwood is. But uh, creosote is a beautiful, wonderful plant, has special relationships with so many cool insects. Um, surprisingly, desert tortoises, this just still baffles me, but they, they eat this and um, particularly flowers, but they, they eat the leaves too. It's also just a good habitat plant too, right? So um, another thing I, I haven't s s talked about as much as I should have is you're not only planting plants in the tortoise enclosure for them to eat, but you also want them to be hanging out underneath things and getting shade when they want to and um, et cetera. So, um, so creosote bush is of course a really cool plant. Um, Side note, one of the oldest living organisms in the world is a, um, what they call the king clone uh, creosote bush in California. It's, uh, it looks like a fairy ring. It's a ring of creosotes. It started off in the middle and over years and years and years, it, it, the plant, you know, re-roots, right? And it just keeps growing and the middle died out, but this, this ring of creosote bush keeps growing and growing and growing and it's thousands and thousands of years old. Like, I don't remember how old, but it's one of the oldest living organisms in the planet. So uh, cool side note. Um, here's some other plants to, to uh, consider when you're thinking of your tortoise. Now, the one on the right, you don't wanna grow that on purpose, right? Um, if you don't know this plant, you do. Um, if you've stepped on um, something that just made your foot want to die, <laughs> or like, or you ride in your bicycle and uh, and your tires are blowing out all the time, it's because of this plant, damn plant. Um, it has I didn't put a picture in there, but it has a really spiky fruit and it hurts so bad to step on. It's the worst thing in the world. If you see this plant, kill it with fire or feed it to your desert tortoise because desert tortoises love this plant and they eat it. So, because they love this family, they eat plants in this family. So there's one, don't plant it, but if it comes up in your yard, uh, pull it up and feed it to your tortoise. Um, then there's just two other plants that 
you might not have even known they're related to creosote bush, um, the Arizona poppy. So this, the Arizona poppy is not the winter one, right? The Mexican poppy that grows, um, that, that grows uh, in the winter time. This is the summer poppy that you see, like if you're driving out towards the desert museum, you see the orange on the roadside. Um, that's, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's gonna be the uh, Arizona poppy. And it's not a poppy, it's, is, it's a zygophilaceae. It's uh, related to creosote bush. And it actually has very similar leaves to the goat's head. Sometimes people think a goat's head is coming up and they're accidentally pulling up the Arizona poppies, which is kind of sad. So try to learn the difference. The leaves are a little bigger and a little more spread out on the, um, on the calstroemia. Um, the, the tribulus has a lot tighter foliage and it's usually hugging the ground a little bit more. And obviously the flower is very different. So once it's flowering, you can definitely tell. Just don't let the goat's head flower too much and form seeds before you pull it. <clears throat> and then finally, the purple shrub there is, uh, you can call that the Sonoran um, creosote bush, although Sonora has the regular creosote bush too. But just south of the border, this plant shows up and it's gorgeous. It looks kind of like a creosote bush, um, much easier to grow, by the way. It's not so cranky um, in a container, um, but it has these gorgeous purple flowers and they're quite big. Um, there's a bunch of these at the Desert Museum if you ever wanna see, um, wonderful plant. This family is a cool family, the Nictaginaceae, the four o'clock family. Um, they're, they're annuals and perennials most of them are night blooming. Um, <clears throat> most of them, uh, especially the perennials, are tap rooted. They go completely dormant and die to the ground in the winter time, and then they come up in the spring. Um, and they're moth pollinated, a lot like the Onagracy, those night bloomers, right? Um, so here's a few plants that plants on the right. Not the best picture. I don't really have good pictures of that plant, but oh wow, look at the respelling too. Uh, Borjavia coccinia, not coccigea. <laughs> uh, I tried to go through and catch all those, um, the, you know, the spell check problems. But anyway, that's Borjavia coccinia. It's called red spiderling. Now look at that plant on the right. You may know that plant even if you don't know it, right? Because it's that plant that comes up in our yards. It's again, not something people usually plant, but it's, um, it's a uh, it's very prevalent and so um it's a it's a great free plant for your tortoises if it comes up in your friend's yard or your yard or in the alleyways you can pull it up for your tortoise um and, and you know maybe you can grab try to get some seed off it. it's actually not a bad little plant it's got you know pinkish flowers they call it coccinia which means boar javier coccinia means red flower and some of them are indeed red but a lot of them look more like a, a bright pink color. You know that plant? Yeah. Yeah. It's also a uh, an important larval food plant for a whole bunch of cool moths too. So um, there's that. Um, and, and actually this is a good um, plant family for moth um, larval food, um, like some really cool moths. Um, <clears throat> the two plants on the Left there are plants that we've grown and sold at the nursery, Mirabilis multiflora and Mirabilis longiflora. Um, longiflora is really cool and, and kind of shrubby. You actually get, get you know a few feet tall, um, but kind of unruly and mangy looking almost. Um, and then when dusk comes, all those flowers open up and it's, it's spectacular. It, it kind of surprises you because it's just this kind of, not rangy is not a good word. It's just like a very, leafy plant and um, doesn't have like a it's an unruly shape which bothers some people until you see it bloom and then dusk you know dusk or the morning if you wake up in the morning you know whether you're a night person or, or a uh, morning person um, go check this plant out and then the, the flowers just they just come out of nowhere and they're just beautiful and big and um, and if you're lucky enough you'll catch the moths pollinating it um, and then that Mirabilis multiflora is a, a similar a bigger flower, uh, not not a long flower, uh, not as long as the longiflora, obviously, but um, but and that plant's more of a low growing, ground covery kind of plant. Um, cool plants. Uh, Mirabilis is a cool genus, and there's other ones too. Actually, I back up here. 
that I didn't talk about that one in the picture there, but that's the narrow leaf um, four o'clock. And uh, that's, uh, it's a smaller flower, but it's really pretty. We'll, we'll sell this plant, we're, we're growing it. <clears throat> um, it's, uh, we see it all the time when we're out on the road um, and when we're hiking and stuff. You usually see it on like road cuts. And, uh, and again, in the morning or at dusk is when you see it because it's blooming and uh, has these cute little pink flowers. And we, we just love this little plant. It, this isn't like the showiest plant in the world for a lot of people, but we like it. <clears throat> um, this family, the Vitaceae. Um, so, you know, they uh, are, are the tortoises that we've had the longest, like we've been feeding them a lot of grape leaves. They love it. Um, and so we got a, an Arizona grape in our front yard. Um, <clears throat> our tortoises eat that poor plant doesn't get a chance to grow because we, we harvest the leaves on it all the time by the way you can make uh you you can pickle those leaves and make a uh, domade salad um you know the um is that greek mediterranean yeah, yeah. uh so you, you can use any grape leaf any vitus really um for that so there's a human use if you need one. Um, Vitus Rogers Red is one we sell a lot. It's an accidental hybrid from California uh, where the native Vitus Californica accidentally hybridized with um, Vitus vinifera, which is the, the um, wine, uh, wine grape. So um, anyway, they hybridized and it's cool. It also turns scarlet red in the wintertime. Um, these are deciduous plants, by the way. And then that, that weirdo on the right is, um, this is a plant that was a little more common in the trade in the 90s, and I almost never see it anymore. We're, we're trying to get this growing too. It's, uh, they call it Arizona grape ivy, not to be confused with Arizona grape. Um, this is a weirdo because it's succulent. It, it's, uh, it's got succulent leaves and it still drops its leaves in the winter. Um, but it's, it's a cool plant. If you have ever been to um, Cafe a la carte at the Tucson Desert Museum, um, their back patio is absolutely covered in this plant. Um, this is the plant that grows there. So anyway, uh, cool plant. Um, all these are, of course, adored by tortoises and some are growing winter dormant. <clears throat> Here's another family, the big noniaceae uh three exam or two examples actually the, i'm getting away from the families now but the two plants in the bottom the desert willow and the trumpet vine shut up shut up dang shut up <laughs> uh the desert willow and the trumpet vine are big known ac uh that's the um uh what's the name of that family what's a famous plant it's that they hybridize the tens of chalopsis yeah, the catal the catalpa um, is that fam. It's a catalpa family. Sometimes people call it the trumpet vine family too. Um, there's a hybrid between catalpa and chalopsis, the desert willow. They call it ch uh, chitalpa. Um, it's an intergeneric hybrid, which is unusual. Um, all these are good for the tortoises. They eat the leaves, and but they really love the flowers. It's like um, it's like Doritos to a, to a tortoise. Um, or chocolate. Chocolate. I like that better. It makes me sound classier, but the truth <laughs> is, I mean, I do love chocolate, but I have this sad, 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 uh, love for Doritos. It's like against everything I believe in. Anyway, uh, desert buckwheat up on the upper left, uh, side there. Um, totally unrelated to any of these plants, but um, what is it, Polygonaceae, I think. Um, the desert buckwheat is really great because it's a, it grows really wide. It doesn't grow that tall. And um, it's also a larval food plant for like eight zillion butterflies. The flowers also attract a lot of butterflies and native bees. Um, Desert buckwheat is one of the best wildlife plants you can plant. Super cool plant. Give it space. That thing grows wide. It just um, grows fast and it grows wide. It does go semi dormant in the um, in the uh, summertime. So don't freak out and think it's dying. It'll get a little brown or whatever. Um, hey, come here. 
you want to say hi? This is not a tortoise. This is not a tortoise. This is Ansel. He's really fat. <laughs> hi, buddy. How are you doing? He's just, uh, he wants attention. Um, all right. And so that was the desert buckwheat. Um, look, I haven't lost very many people. That's good. Um, penstemons. Uh, the penstemon species are, uh, oh, this battery. Oh, okay. I'm glad I remembered. Because uh, I usually forget that. Um, Pensamen species, they're all um, edible to tortoises. I think they especially love the flowers. Almost the whole family of the Asteraceae, so that dogweed, the daisy family, they, uh, tortoises will eat pretty much any daisy plant too. Um, snapdragon vine, really cool plant, um, actually related to the um, Pensamen, um, but they, they love that plant and it also um, is a prolific producer of foliage and um, uh, and flowers, and uh, it's a vine. So if you need a vine to go on a like chain link fence, chain link fence in your tortoise enclosure, don't depend on a chain link fence to keep them in. Um, that's a good plant. So uh, in case you need a vine, um, and uh, these guys, oh, you know that dichondra on the right hand side. Um, any dichondra they'll eat. And by the way. If you got Bermuda grass, as long as you're not spraying it with some crud, um, which a lot of people do, and don't use synthetic fertilizers on it, uh, but if you got Bermuda grass, tortoises can eat that and it's fine. Um, they love it actually. Um, but anyway, Dichondra, uh, believe it or not, uh, Dichondra argentea is native here. And actually there are several species of native Dichondras in Arizona. Um, so tortoises eat this and they tend to be native to the areas where tortoises are found. But that, that, that variety that you find in nurseries, and again, like, don't, don't buy one from Home Depot, please, and feed it to your tortoise because it's probably been nuked. Um, if you go into any big nursery, nurseries are terrible. We're one of the only nurseries in, in not just Tucson, but like, ever. Uh, I mean, in the country, there's not a lot of plant nurseries for some reason that are, um, that are organic. And it's, it's a long story why a lot of excuses are made, but, um, but, you know, horticultural plants, there's not a lot of rules about what you can spray on them and it's terrible. So like particularly, really buddy right now, uh, it's terrible, but they can spray anything on horticultural plants. And so if you take these plants home from uh, these major chains, be careful and don't, you know, don't feed them to your tortoise, at least like keep it away from them for a long time. The thing is like they use systemics too, and, and it may not kill your desert tortoise, but it may not be good for it. So like, you know, we eat this stuff all the time too. We eat this, these poisons um, and it's not good. So you know, try to try to source your plants from organic nurseries. Um. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to be that way. I, I like sending people to other nurseries, but uh, I'm really sad about um, the fact that these nursery that that even local nurseries just can't stay away from pesticides. That they make excuses. Just, just let a crop fail. Who cares? Okay onward to passiflora uh, you can use any passiflora um of course the arizonica is really great because it's native and it's cool um but we have three species in arizona um uh, there's brian uh, passiflora brianoides and passiflora mexicana those are the three and they eat all of them um so they love that and uh, they love anisocanthus and any family uh, you know we, we talked about that family last week um the uh what family is it <laughs> anisocanthus ruellia Acanth. is in the acanthaceae thank you um all the acanthaceae are great for tortoises i didn't want to talk too much about them because we went over them last week but they're great tortoise foods so um finally uh one fruit that's really good for the tortoises um are uh cactus fruits and you don't want them only eating cactus fruits but it's good for them and it gives them murder face. And who doesn't want a tortoise with murder face? It's like it's our so favorite cute. thing. Oh, it's really cute. 
Don't worry about the spines. They're, uh, they're equipped to deal in with that. I don't know how. They'll even eat the pads. Yeah, they eat especially the, the young ones. Yeah. If they uh, can reach them. Yeah, and, if, and then if they're softer and younger too. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it baffles me that animals can just eat cactus. The cows do it all the time too, but, um, but I just don't get it. But they love it, and, um, and, it, and it creates a cute murder face on uh, tortoises. So um, who doesn't want a uh, murder face? <laughs> all right. That is, that's it for this class. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. We always have to wait a few minutes or a minute or so before uh, we know that's, that you've seen this part because there's this delay. So we're gonna have a little drink. I'm gonna have a little drink. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, that's good. Mm. Mm, so good. Um, Is it too late in the season to plant globe mallow seeds? No. I live in Mesa, <clears throat> otherwise. Goodbye. Yeah, so um, by the way, we don't do this to sell plants, so don't feel bad about um, about that. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, shifting some things around here. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we do this for education. So we're not doing this to sell plants. Half the plants we talked about today, we don't even have right now. Um, and but uh, you know, do your best to you know find the best sources for your plants. Um, as far as growing from seed, yes, you can grow mal globe mallow from seed now. Um, the best time to start is in September or even October. Uh, they're, they're a, you can consider them kind of a wild flower, like a winter cool season wildflower, even though they are perennials. Um, they die to the ground um, if they don't get enough water in the summertime and then they come back in the fall. And, um, <clears throat> but they also act as a, as a, um, as an annual sometimes too. And so we were talking about globe mallows and I, I kind of avoided diving in, but you know, since you asked the question, um, it's a cool thing about globe mallow is uh, if you if you uh, bust open one of their fruits, right? So the fruit, when I, when I mean fruit, I don't mean, uh, you know, a fruit, I mean just like where their seeds are, right? And, and bust it open and look at the individual seeds. You'll notice that some of them are shiny black and then some of them are kind of almost coated looking. They look like milky, like they have a coating around them and that's because they do. And so Glow Mallow has been, um, it's actually basically, it's setting up a, uh, it's hedging its bets because not every year is a nice wet year where they're gonna get enough rain to, uh, to germinate the seed. Um, and the typical, I think, for the pattern for globe mallow in nature is that you get a nice monsoon and then that monsoon carries into the fall. A this is super bloom years, right? It carries into the fall, germinates those seeds, and there's enough rainfall throughout that winter that it keeps them going until a nice winter rain happens. And those are our super bloom years, but it's also the, um, the years that create the most recruitment for um, plants not just wildflowers, but all native plants. So um, it's those wet years. And so if you're planting from seed, you, you can do it now too. You're gonna start them, if you start them now, they're just gonna be like smaller when they start to bloom. But if you keep them well watered, they will carry through summer or you can just let them go to seed and then hopefully they will come up in the fall. But um, we're always a fan of um, expanding water um, for the interests of wildlife. So you've heard, uh, you've heard us say this before, don't feel bad about watering plants because it's the only time that the water you use goes to the wildlife, right? So feel bad about flushing the toilet because that water goes nowhere and you use it to, you know, that that's, you feel bad about that, right? I mean, why don't we have compost toilets? I don't know, we're in the desert. That's a terrible use of water. But watering plants is the only time that we're pulling this water out of the ground or out of the Colorado River and, um, and using them, using that water for wildlife. When you water a plant, you're, you're watering the microbes in the ground, you're watering the microbes on the tree, on the, on the surface of the plant, you're watering um, uh, food for birds, you're watering food for insects, you're watering, you know, 
butterfly larva, um, reptile food. It, like, it, 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 there's never a waste of water when you're watering plants. So anyway, yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> do we sell any of the grass species in seed form? We do have some in seed form. Um, right now, the best ones to go for, we've got one called Short Stuff Seed Mix. Um, and that one's actually basically tortoise food. Yeah. Um, that's why they call it, that's short. That's why they called it short stuff. There's actually a picture of a tortoise on the. There is. And it's got, um, it <clears throat> does have some, I think it has some summer annuals. Mm -hmm. Pectus papuosa, which is a summer. And the calistramia. The Arizona poppy. Um, so it has summer and winter annuals and it's got grasses and it's got, um, perennials in it so that one's a good one um if you're looking for something bigger you could do the southeast arizona native grass mix that's a good one so check out <clears throat> on our the the southeastern arizona grass mix has 18 species of grasses it's 18 or 16 or something like that i don't know it's, it's in a there. lot anyway that you get the point it's there's a lot so we we have some grass seed for sale go to our uh it's, it's it's not specifically just grass seed but it's mixes the um, one is 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 all grass seed yeah the the grass mix the big one and it, it's like there's two sizes a 12 dollar size that they will cover most yards and then there's like a giant one for 36 dollars, which is more if you have like acreage you're working with but um definitely but yes. definitely <clears throat> some super spreaders in there um let's see do we know, is there recommended square footage for a tortoise enclosure? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, the I would bigger just- Bigger the better. Bigger the better. <laughs> Honestly. How's that for a cop out? <laughs> <laughs> big. How big can you make it? Do that. <clears throat> um, the one at our nursery is, uh, oh, how long is that thing? 30 feet? No. 25? Maybe maybe about 25 feet long, but he gets out all the time. So um, that's the other thing. He actually too. has the run of the nursery. So um, now our nursery closes up and especially now uh, with COVID, we keep the gates closed, but. Um, and they do <clears throat> go through periods where like, there's definitely in the springtime, I think Willard's looking for a mate. So he's a lot more, um, Randy. more likely to escape and try to escape. Yeah. Um, so the bigger, the better, the better wall you can do into the ground and in, up above is better. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, sh I don't know, maybe Tom Van Devender talks about. Hold on. I'm just going to read this book and find out. And I'm no. sure the Desert Museum gives a specification of how big a tortoise enclosure should be. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good about that stuff. Yeah. I, oh, I, you know what? I didn't put that as a, as a source of information, but the Desert Museum has a whole program, and I I'm pretty sure they have a suggestion sure for um, for area. Um, let's see. So, if you give them organic greens, should they be room temperature? Recommendations for water dishes: shallow water dishes. Shallow are good. And clean them out. Like, don't let them get gunky um i don't know if it matters if the greens are room temperature i don't know i'm sure it doesn't hurt yeah if, i mean if it's super cold it might be but i it, i don't think that's too much of an issue um <clears throat> can the tortoises eat the yellow cactus fruits from the barrel cactus they can they can yes the the i don't know if they like it as much um but they can eat it Oh, cool. Someone said Game and Fish website has the square footage requirements. There you go. Um, yeah, we just always aim for uh, as much as possible. <clears throat> Sweet. Someone found the tortoise book at UA Press. So. Oh, good. Oh, uh, so it's not out of print. That's great. Because uh, uh, this is UA Press, I believe. So that's great. Yep. University of Arizona Press. So Apparently it's still um, in print, so. <laughs> or you can get back copies. You're welcome, U of A Press. <laughs> we should we should try to get some. I've worked with them before. Should yeah. sell this book. Um, yeah. So um, 
Uh, let's see, what, what, what else do we have here? Prepping to refortify. Someone's oh. tortoise escaped. Did they wake up and escape? Oh, no, Elvis just escaped. Uh, Elvis. Talk to your neighbors. Um, yeah, so um, you guys hear that meowing in the background? <laughs> Somebody's cat is going crazy. Yeah, it's neighbors. Not, ours. not our cat. Um, surprised you can't hear the rooster. <laughs> um we just gave away we had <laughs> we had three roosters well actually we had four we've had one for a long time we live in a neighborhood that they're really cool about it like nobody cares everyone's nana has a rooster in menlo park but um but uh um we had some babies that were born in the coop and they all three of them were roosters and there was a little too much to have four roosters because they kind of egg each other on and our friend julie uh just um um housed our, it took those roosters in because yeah. i guess her neighbors won't care <laughs> uh what else have we got any more questions i think that's it for questions if but if you have other questions... Yeah, by the way, you don't have to ask questions only about tortoises uh, or tortoise enclosures. Like, we, we always open this up for, um, you know, questions about anything you have. As long as it's answerable. Like, if you say, I don't know what's wrong with my plant, um, it, it, unless we have email pictures. Us. Yeah, email us <laughs> if you have a question like that. But if you have a, you know, general question about something, let us know. Um, we do almost always have tortoise plants because we're fanatics about tortoises, but also we're fanatics about native plants and desert tortoises are mostly native plants. Don't freak out about um, too much about it because just if you mostly plant native plants and emphasize some of these plants we've been telling you about, um, don't worry, you're not gonna put the wrong plant in there. Like desert tortoises know what they're supposed to eat. Um, you don't have to worry about them. Um, this, this will be up on YouTube. Um, yeah, this later. video. This video is even though it's live, it gets stored up um, on um, on our YouTube, and we're we're going to create a little page with all our past classes. Um, I had one, and then I, I need to redo it. So um, but yes, it's available. Go on our YouTube channel um, to find it, and or on our website soon we'll have a little page from with all our um, older classes. Um, yeah. Yeah. We did it. Another class. We were a little bit um, uh, doing this every week can sometimes be a, a bit of work, <laughs> especially great. since it's spring. We're, we're busy right now. But um, in, in, oh, thanks, Lori. Yeah, for, it's a lot of work, but it's 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 work. it's good it's fun once we do it <laughs> yeah it's fun and it's important to us like this is almost more important than selling the plants we want you to have the information or else if you have like if you have a bad time and you're not doing you're not getting the information you need you're not going to keep doing this right and we won't we don't want we want you to care and love doing all this so um so yeah um, let us know always if there's a class that, you know, um, you want to see. Some people have given us some great suggestions and some suggestions have been more like, we could totally just answer that question. That's not a class. <laughs> and then so, some subjects are too big, um, but right? If you, but always, yeah, if you have questions, just ask. We, um, we're trying to like hone these class things so that it's a, it's a manageable amount of time. She's pushing my leg, which means... <laughs> questions are done questions if are you have done. questions email us at sales at spadefootnursery.com yes or, or you facebook. can text us or you can facebook or instagram message us yes let us know we're gonna go eat dinner and uh thanks for coming thanks for coming hey our wildflowers are in and our tomatoes and peppers oh my god tomatoes and peppers you guys and e toy onions. <gasps> oh my god, I'm so tired of people asking for e toy onions. <laughs> we got them, okay?